Good afternoon. My name is Paul Peterson. I come to you from the Pacific Northwest of the United States. I represent a company called Montana Technologies. And I'd like to talk with you today about an innovation that we've created that we hope will solve two major problems in the world. One, the climate impact of the rapid adoption of air conditioning and water scarcity crisis. Montana Technologies, over the last 20 plus years, has been involved in the development of renewable power generation technologies from biogas to wind and solar and solar thermal. And our latest innovation is a product called AirJewel. First of all, I want to thank you for your patience and apologize in advance if I screw up because, quite frankly, I'm a lot more comfortable in the R&D lab and the prototype shop. So public speaking is not my thing, but I appreciate your patience. And I think this is so important that I'll overcome my fear of public speaking to show you the impact of AirJewel. Now, let's start with the fundamentals of the problem and a little bit of history. This gentleman is named Willis Carrier. Willis Carrier, in the year 1902, 121 years ago, invented air conditioning as we know it. Back then, it was a breakthrough, a phenomenon that changed the world, enabled food storage, medical storage, creature comforts in our homes, our buildings, our hospitals. But they didn't anticipate, and they didn't really think about the unintended consequences. Back then, air conditioning, much like it is still today, operates simply by vapor compression, squeezing the humidity out of the ambient air around us to deliver a dry, dehumidified air stream to a refrigerant cycle. Back then, Freon, 134A in, in later years, and all kinds of chlorofluorocarbons that are now banned, but the refrigerants then delivered cool air into the building, and now our cars, our houses, everywhere. The problem that they didn't anticipate is that cooling our buildings are heating our planet. And what they didn't anticipate and what's good news for Carrier and Train and Rheem and Lennox and York and Daikin and all the global air conditioning manufacturers is that the adoption rate of air conditioning is so high that there are currently today about 1.2 billion air conditioners around the world in use. And by the year 2050, especially as developing economies in the global south start to create enough disposable income for billions of their populations to adopt this Western creature comfort, that number is going to grow to over 5 billion. The problem is, in American cities, for example, almost 40% of the electricity demand on our municipal grids is consumed by air conditioning. In cities like Houston, in New Orleans, in Miami, and in places like Dubai, and Kuala Lumpur, and Delhi, it's as high as 60%, 70%. It's a problem. It's the elephant in the room that is creating and exacerbating a negative feedback loop that nobody's really talking about. Consider the demand for air conditioning becoming now a necessity for survival. We all saw the heat waves kill thousands and thousands of people across Europe last year and the year before and the year before, and it's getting worse. And it's getting worse in India, and it's getting worse in the global south. And of course, what's the solution? More air conditioning. More air conditioning, however, produces more greenhouse gases which exacerbates the negative feedback loop that leads to warmer ambient temperatures. Warmer air absorbs more humidity. 
The warmer the ambient air, the greater the uptake of humidity, the greater the rate of evaporation from our lakes, our rivers, our groundwater, and warmer ocean surfaces. As the evaporation rates increase, and the groundwater and our aquifers and our lakes and our rivers continue to deplete, the atmospheric humidity rates increase worldwide. It's not democratic. As atmospheric humidity increases around the world, if we continue to use early 20th century inefficient vapor compression technology in our air conditioning systems, they have to work harder. The higher the humidity, the more energy is consumed in the air conditioning process itself, which exacerbates even further the negative feedback loop, which leads to greater evaporation rates, lower levels of our aquifers, of our reservoirs, and a negative impact on our ability to produce um, energy from, uh, uh, from you know, hydroelectric dams, and ultimately to instability in the grid and grid failure, which we've also seen and experienced with brownouts and blackouts. When the, heat gets, when the heat gets higher and the humidity gets higher, our cities go dark. Air Jewel addresses that problem, and I'll tell you why as we get a little further here into the technology itself. Another application of Air Jewel that we later realized was, was impactful, deeply impactful, in my personal opinion, more impactful even so than, than the carbon footprint impact of air conditioning, is the impact that air jewel can have on the water scarcity crisis. Everyone here in this room is familiar with the water scarcity crisis and how it's becoming worse and worse, and how that's leading to more political upheaval more risk of armed conflict, increase in climate refugees, increase in waterborne illnesses. There are millions of people all over the world today living in humanitarian aid, refugee relief, disaster recovery camps with very limited access to potable water, if they're lucky. And it's very, very expensive for the NGOs to deliver water to these climate refugees. The UN estimates, and this is a crazy number, but I believe it to be true, that around this planet, every single day, the amount of human potential that is wasted in gathering water is as much as 200 million hours per day in aggregate, wasted by mostly women and girls and the most vulnerable among us gathering water for their families. Not just the carbon footprint impact, but the human potential impact that Air Jewel can make on our world is what gets me excited and gets our team more and more motivated to deploy our technology as far and wide as we possibly can. As the water scarcity crisis is further and further exacerbated, people have to walk further and further to access potable water. They're more at risk of waterborne illnesses like Zika, Cryptosporidium, Malaria, the list goes on and on. And we have to drill wells deeper and deeper and deeper, and they get more and more expensive into aquifers that are more and more increasingly polluted. What happens when you finally get to a water source for your village or your family, and it's contaminated? We looked at this problem from the perspective of a bunch of engineers and geeks and nerds when we realized that what we had invented, that thing that we call air jewel, to, to increase the efficiency of air conditioning was in fact the world's most efficient dehumidifier. How does that tie into water scarcity? 
we already understand how it ties into air conditioning. It reduces the energy required to, 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 to cool a building or, uh, or a data center or your home. But as a hyper-efficient dehumidifier, we realize that we could cost-effectively, energy-efficiently treat the atmosphere around us as an aquifer. Right now, everyone in this audience, we all are swimming in the world's largest aquifer. There is more potential potable water in the atmosphere, especially in humid climates, than there is in all the lakes, all the rivers, all the groundwater, all the aquifers in the world today. We just figured out a way to cost-effectively tap that aquifer and condense it into PFAS-free drinking water. The way we did that is with material science and chemistry. We created, together with the U.S. Department of Energy, this coating that you see here. It's called a MOF, M-O-F, Metal Organic Framework. It's an extraordinarily absorbent, very fine material, like graphene, that happens to have a very high absorb uh, uh, um, rate of absorption of water vapor and a very high rate of desorption of water vapor under negative pressure conditions. So very unique properties that we, quite frankly, discovered on accidentally. Which means that when this system is exposed to atmosphere, like this, with the gates open, that's one of our air jewel prototypes and demonstration units right there, it absorbs atmospheric humidity at an extraordinarily high rate and high volumes. Then, when the metal organic framework material is saturated, we close these gates and we pull a vacuum. It takes very little energy compared to brute force vapor compression of the old days. That dries out the material and we condense the water and we can deliver it for drinking, for washing, for any use. It's PFAS free, it's pure distilled water. That application of AirJewel compared to old conventional systems, if you see this column on the left, I know it's small print, but brute force vapor compression, that which Willis Carrier began with and what's still in use today, has a coefficient of performance of about 3 to 3.5. In other words, it costs a heck of a lot of energy per liter of, of humidity extracted and condensed. The air jewel system, because of the, of the efficient desiccant properties of our material and the method by which we, we dehydrate the desiccant material, only consumes about 20% of the energy per liter of water. So we reduce the energy consumption of an air conditioning system by about 60 to 70% which has a massive carbon footprint impact. And AirJewel produces potable water at a rate of about five to 10 times more than brute force vapor compression. As we've all seen, your air conditioners at your homes and your car when you stop, drips, 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 condensed water. Our system produces about 10 times or more the amount of water for the same amount of energy input. We have developed multiple versions of the air jewel system and have uh, multiple patents in 44 countries and have partnered with multiple uh, OEMs around the world to scale manufacturing of the air jewel system and integrate into HVAC systems from residential, commercial, industrial, all the way up to large data centers, which are massive consumers of water and energy for cooling. We are demonstrating this system right here that you see on the screen at COP28 in Dubai uh, next month, uh, December. This is our big launch event. We have been in stealth development for about three years. We have uh, gone beyond proof of concept and prototype and uh, our beginning manufacturing scaling. And in partnership with multiple OEMs and national laboratories around the United States and around the world are now ready to begin scalable manufacturing. In about five weeks, we'll be presenting this in Dubai at the Global COP conference. 
our partnerships around the world for chemistry, or BASF, the big German chemical company, they produce our metal organic framework material. CATL, one of the largest industrial conglomerates in the world, a Chinese battery company is our manufacturer for that part of the world. Pacific Northwest National Laboratories is one of our partners. They're a US Department of Energy lab, among others, universities and researchers around the planet. That's it fundamentally. The breakthrough in dehumidification is basically boring, but we realized that it has massive potential carbon impact in as the global south adopts this western ubiquitous creature comfort technology. And it has potential for massive impact in the water scarcity crisis all around the world. Thank you for your attention.